Anybody ready to receive from the Lord today? Is anybody ready for that? Come to church ready? Ooh, wow, that's good. Awesome. All right. Because we're talking about favor today. So if you didn't cheer, you're going to really wish you had in a few minutes, all right? We're talking about the favor of God. And I, I think... I think that probably all of us have been shown favor at some point in our life, haven't we? You ever been shown favor by someone? If you're a child and you have a parent, I guarantee you your parents have shown you undeserved favor at some point, undeserved forgiveness. But maybe you just had an experience in your life where you got to do something that was just like next level awesome. I don't know. It could be as simple as getting upgraded to first class on a flight. That ever happened to anybody? It's only happened to me twice, but when it does, it's pretty awesome, you know? You've got that old middle seat in the back of the plane, and you just know there's going to be two giant dudes with hoggy elbows on both sides of you. And then the flight attendant says, you know what? We had to shuffle some things around, so we're going to put you up in, in first class. Unlimited mini Twix bars and as many pillows and blankets as I want, you know? It's great. It's a good feeling. Or, or maybe it's just a, a moment you've had backstage passes or VIP seats at a concert or something like that. Maybe you got to fly on someone's private jet if you're a really big deal. I, I don't know, but those, those moments where we have those kinds of experiences, you know what I'm talking about, where it's just like our everyday ordinary lives, which are fine, but we sort of get to exit that for a moment and live something that's just a little bit more luxurious, a little bit more elite, you know? And probably I think most of us would say, I could use a little more favor in my life. I could use a little more of those moments and those, and those seasons because it's fun and it feels good, isn't it? Like it's something that makes us feel valued and feel important. And uh, today we're looking at a man named Joseph, working through the book of Genesis. And we're looking at the story of a man named Joseph as we sort of get to the end of the book here. We've been working through this series now for several weeks. And Joseph was a man who understood favor and the favor of God in his life probably better than anyone that I could think of. Like Joseph had this just unmerited, crazy level of favor in his life. And we're going to find his story today in, in chapter 39 of Genesis. If you need a Bible, we have our amazing red shirt team right here. They're trying to give away Bibles. So if you want a Bible, if you need one, raise your hand and they'll get it to you. And that's our gift to you. If you need a Bible, take it, make it yours. We would love it if you would do that and we'd be honored. So take advantage of that today. Chapter 39 is where we're going to pick up his story. But there's something we need to understand about Joseph is that he was used to being the favorite because he was his father's favorite son. All right, so we've got immediate family dysfunction in our story here right away. Like we've got a favorite son. Now we all know parents, we're not supposed to have favorites, are we? That's not a good idea and it only ends poorly for everyone else. Jacob, who was Joseph's father, had 10 sons before Joseph. But for some reason, Joseph is his, is his favorite, right? Pastor Brent talked about Jacob for several weeks in this series and all the dysfunction that was a part of his family and all the craziness that we don't have time to get into today. You can read it for yourself. But you've got to understand that this is a jacked up biblical family portrait. If anybody tells you that you need to you know, conduct your family business more biblically, just say, listen, I don't even know about that. Like this, some of these families in these stories are crazy, messed up, and they're insane. So understandably, if Joseph is the favorite son, he's got 10 older brothers, they hate his guts, right? They just, they, they hate him. He's a little, he's a little twerp and dad, he's dad's favorite. And so eventually they just get totally fed up with Joseph. And I mean like very fed up to the point where they're like, okay, we've got to end this forever. Their dad gave Joseph this really fancy coat. I mean, it was probably like a Gucci leather jacket or something. I don't know, but he gave him this jacket and told the rest of them, well, you guys just go kill a goat and make your own clothes. And so they said, that's it. We're done with Joseph. We're getting rid of him forever. So they go out in the field to like sort of tend their flocks and do their shepherding thing. And they grab him and they throw him in this pit. He's down there in this pit and he's stuck. And they're like, now what do we do with him? He's in the pit. So that's good. We made it this far, and then they see some slave traders just kind of riding by on their camels. A different culture, different world back then. Someone got a really good idea. Hey, we're going to sell Joseph to these slave traders. Like, he's going to be, like, sell him off. They're going to take him somewhere. He's going to pay for the rest of his life, like, serving as a slave. And the best part is, we'll never have to see him again. We'll never have to deal with him again. Then maybe dad will give us a, a Gucci jacket. I don't know. So they decide we're going to sell him off into slavery. So they, they do it. They send him off. They, take it, they rip off his fancy jacket before he leaves. And they, they rip it all up. And they dip it in some goat's blood. And they take it home. And they tell their dad the Sasquatch ate him or, or something while they, were, while they were out in the fields. But the bottom line is Joseph's gone, Dad. And he's not coming back. And so we can move on with our lives now. Maybe you'll love the rest of us a little bit. And so they sell Joseph off and thinking they've solved their problem. It's just a normal, healthy family dynamic. That's good conflict resolution, right? Some of the middle schoolers and the high schoolers in the room right now are like, you can sell your brother? That's an option. 
Siri, how do I sell my brother? How does that process start? But they, they get rid of him and they think that's it and that's the end. But if you know the story at all, you know that Joseph's story is really just beginning. And check out what happens when he gets, when he gets to Egypt. Verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 39 says, When Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. And Potiphar was the captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So this guy is a big deal. And look at verse 2 right here, because this is crucial to what we're talking about. The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything that he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Verse 2, he was succeeded in everything that he did. So now Joseph was... Joseph was anointed by God. The Lord was with Joseph, it says. So he was raised being the favorite son of his father. And then he's sold off into slavery. But now he's in Egypt. He's a slave, and that should be a bad thing. But it seems like now he's, he's God's favorite too. He was his dad's favorite his whole life. And now it says the Lord was with Joseph. And the Lord's taking care of him and watching the Lord. So now he's been his dad's favorite and he's God's favorite. And then as his life story progresses and we follow through here, it just, he just continues to gain an insane amount of, of favor with everyone that's around him. Look at verse 3. It says that Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything that he did. This pleased Potiphar, so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything that he owned. And from the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, look at this, this is crazy. The Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All of his household affairs ran smoothly, and his crops and livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. And with Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing, I love this, except what kind of food to eat. Just because Joseph was in the house, God blessed Potiphar's affairs. God blessed Potiphar's household. It says it right there that the only thing, the only decision that he had to make every day was what to have for breakfast, sausage or bacon. And then he was done for the day. It says it right there. Oh, he only had to worry about what food he was going to eat. It says it right in the Bible. Joseph took care of everything else. Joseph was handling all the business. Potiphar for the rest of the day could just kick back and take it easy and sit off in the shade and be fanned by palm fronds and practice his hieroglyphics or play Sudoku or something. But he was just kicking it back, taking it easy while Joseph did everything for him. So Joseph has been his father's favorite. He seems to be a clear favorite of his heavenly father. And now he's Potiphar's favorite, right? Everywhere this guy goes, favor, 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 favor. Everybody loves Joseph. He's everybody's favorite. But this next verse is where things get a little bit, a little bit juicy. I love this because this is stuff that I couldn't write this. I couldn't make this up even if, it, if I tried, but this is, this is the holy word of God. So right here in the second half of, of verse 6 says, I love this. Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. And Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. All right, this is, this is in the Bible, y'all. This is the real deal. This is like a soap opera right here. It's, it's crazy. And we just got to take a second, I think, to, to baste in the goodness of this passage. Okay, this isn't a verse, you know, Genesis 39, 6, that you're going to have probably spoken over you in a moment of prophetic prayer ministry. <laughs> If someone, if you come up to the front here today and our, our prayer team is ministering to you, they're probably not going to speak that verse. Genesis 39, 6, Joseph was a handsome and well-built young man. <laughs> Potiphar's wife looked at him lustfully and said, come and sleep with me. But it's, it's in the Bible. It's there and it's so important. I think we've got to take a minute to, to dissect this a little bit because there's some good stuff there. All right, what I found out, did a little bit of research. Joseph is the only male in the entire Bible who's described in exactly this manner that he was a handsome and well-built young man. There's actually some women that are described this way in the Bible, but Joseph is the only man. Now, there are other dudes, the Bible says they're handsome or good-looking or what have you, but he is handsome and well-built. That a language, it was very illustrious and very elaborate how much they, were, they couldn't say enough about how good-looking Joseph was. We are talking some serious biblical beefcake here, all right? This guy... <laughs> is the poster boy for the, for the, by like the Egyptian romance novels. He was like Fabio. He was on all the covers, right? He was the guy that was standing there like just, just absolutely stacked, handsome and well-built. And, and here's the thing is that Potiphar's wife was his master. He was a slave. We have to remember that. And so for Potiphar's wife to look at him he would have barely been human in her eyes. Maybe not at all, right? That he was a slave. She was a master. She was probably a predator. She'd probably done this before. You know, she's looking at Joseph and to her, he's really just a tall drink of water and mama's real thirsty, you know? <laughs> and so she's like, listen, 
come and sleep with me right now. You're super good looking. And look at what happens in verse 8, though, because this is where it gets really, really crazy, all right? Verse 8 says, but Joseph refused. Remember, he's a slave. Joseph refused. Look, he tells her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He's held back nothing from me except for you because you're his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. So Joseph not only has great abs, he has great character, okay? And he stands up to Potiphar's wife and he says, listen, we can't, we can't do this. You can't do this. This would be a sin against God, sin against your husband. And as a slave, he stands up to his master and says, no, it's not going to happen. That would have been basically signing your death warrants. Again, slaves, you got to understand this power dynamic. They had no right to refuse their masters anything. It probably would have been very commonplace for slaves to be exploited in this manner, in that culture. Again, because they just had no worth and no value as a, as a human being. And so Joseph pays the price for his boldness for standing up to Potiphar's wife. It says in verse 10 that, I love this, she just, you, you can't keep a good woman down. She kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day, but he refused to sleep with her and he, he kept out of her way as much as possible. I love that. You can like picture him like sneaking around the house, you know, like peeking out around the corners, like hiding in the broom closets, trying to avoid her. But one day, however, in verse 11, no one else was around when he went in to do his work. So she came and she grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come on, sleep with me. But Joseph tore himself away and he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. And when she saw that she was holding his cloak and that he had fled, she called out to her servants and soon all the men came running. Look, she said, the axe is about to fall here. My husband has brought this Hebrew slave here to make fools of us. He came into my room to rape me, but I screamed. And when he heard me scream, he ran outside and got away, but he left his cloak behind with me. And she kept the cloak with her until her husband came home. And then she told him her story. That Hebrew slave that you brought into her house tried to come in and fool around with me. The audacity. Who does that guy think that he is? But when I screamed, he ran outside, leaving his cloak with me. If Potiphar's wife couldn't get her way, she was going to make Joseph pay. And that's exactly what she does. When Potiphar comes home, things hit the proverbial fan really fast for Joseph. Look at verse 19. Potiphar was furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and he threw him into the prison where all the king's prisoners were held and there he remained. But look at this, verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph, in case we forgot, in the prison, and he showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph, look at this, a favorite with the prison warden. And before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. And the warden had no more worries, just like Potiphar, because Joseph took care of everything. And look at this last line. The Lord was with him and caused everything that he did to succeed. The chapter ends the exact same way it began, highlighting the fact that the Lord was with Joseph in every facet, every step, every circumstance of his life and gave him success in everything. And I read this story and I read this passage and I read the life of Joseph and think, man, that's amazing for God to be with one person and God to favor one person. That doesn't even seem fair, does it? Like why, why Joseph? Why not me? Why not one of us? Why not one of Joseph's 10 older brothers? Because here's, here's what's crazy. Those 10 older brothers were born into the same you could almost call it the royal family. We all know what the royal family's like, and Meghan Markle just worked her way in there by marrying Prince Harry, right? So back then, God made this covenant with Abraham and all his descendants. These sons were the great grandsons of Abraham, not far removed at all from this great covenant of God where he said, I'm gonna make a nation out of you. All of these sons were members of this royal family. They all had access to the same God, all had access, I think, to the favor and the blessing and the covenant of God in their life. But something is different about Joseph. Something's different about the way he lives his life. And I read a story and I go like, how do, how do I get that in my life? Like, how do I achieve and receive that level of favor in my life? And wouldn't that be incredible? Like, wouldn't that be incredible if our lives were marked? Like, if someone tells our stories later and they say the Lord was with them and gave them success in everything that they did. And I read through and I'm like, well, why, why Joseph? What was so special about him? Why not, one of his, why not one of his brothers? And here's what's interesting is that, is that the more I, I figure out, I, 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 I try to know more about God and learn more about God, and it's a lifelong journey. We never arrive. But it seems pretty clear to me 
from reading this story that, that God does pay favorites, play favorites. But what I know about God as well is that, that he's, he's an equal opportunity employer, okay? And that the same word that's used for favor often in scripture is, is many times the same word that's used for grace in the Greek. It's charis. It's, it's the unlimited, unmerited grace of God. We understand grace. We talk about grace in church all the time. That grace is free and it's abundant and it's for everyone and it never runs out and there's never anything we could do to, to be so far gone that the grace of God can't redeem us and can't fix us. And so that grace is for everyone. The favor of God is for everyone as well. But there seems to be a difference in how people interact with it, how they're blessed by God, and how much favor God gives a certain person. I think that the issue of favor is an issue of of stewardship. Okay, that when we enter into the grace of God, when we accept his gift of salvation, when we're walking with him and we understand grace well, that we're given a measure of favor. We have access to a measure of favor from God, but it's a stewardship issue. It's how we handle it. It's It's how we wield this gift that we've been given. If I, could, if I could give every one of you just a, a priceless gift today, like let's, let's imagine I've got, you know, a massive diamond, like the size of my fist. I've got one for everybody, and I could give it to all of you today. Flawless cut and clarity, of course. Like just, just a priceless gem. And if I could give one to each of you, what would you do with it when you left here? What would you do with it when you got home? Probably there'd be some different varied responses, but I don't think any of us would take that diamond home and toss it in the back of our junk drawer and close it up and just forget it's there, you know? Because it's, it's priceless and it's valuable. We'd want to take it somewhere safe, somewhere secure. We'd want to get it appraised. Some of us would just immediately sell it and buy a boat, you know, like whatever it is, but we would want to maximize the benefit of that gift, wouldn't we? And I think that's exactly what favor is as well. And the reason that Joseph has such an unmerited level of favor in his life is that he was always faithful regardless of his circumstance. And favor is found by the faithful. I'll say that one more time. Favor is found by the faithful. The way that we unlock more outpouring of God's favor in our life is to be faithful with what we've already been given, to be faithful with what we've already been trusted with. Joseph found favor everywhere that he went, regardless of the circuit, in the slavery pit, being sold into slavery, even in prison. It didn't matter where he went. He was faithful, and the favor of God was with him everywhere that he went. And Joseph never compromised his character. Joseph never compromised his belief and his, 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 uh, his mission that he was on from God. It, it fueled everything that he did. And it was that faithfulness that unlocked that level of favor in his life. Am, am I making sense right now? Like that, that because Joseph, no matter where he went, what he did, what happened to him, nothing changed in his relationship with God. Nothing changed in his faithfulness to God. Nothing shook him. Nothing threw him off. Nothing could tempt him from veering off course. And I think that, that sometimes for us, where we, where we sort of mess ourselves up when it comes to God's favor is that we're, we're tempted to compromise our character in certain situations. And so in doing so, we jeopardize the outpouring of favor of God in our life. Whenever we're tempted to do anything that would lead us from being faithful to God and what he's asked us to do in the mission that he's put us on, well, I mean, then we're compromising, aren't we? And I think about like if I was in Joseph's shoes. So here I am and my older brothers all throw me into a pit and then they sell me off to some some slave traders, what would my attitude be? It'd probably be like, listen, boys, if I ever get my hands on you again, like it's going to be sweet revenge and it's going to feel amazing, you know? That would probably be like what just fueled me as I went. It's just this, this opportunity to maybe get a little bit of revenge later on. Like if, if Potiphar's wife propositioned us, like would we have the, the strength and the character to stand up and to, to risk our own lives? We're thrown into prison for something that we didn't even do. I'd have a rotten attitude, I think. Wouldn't you? Like, I'd, I'd want everybody to know how upset I am by this injustice. I'd sit over in the corner and sulk. Just be sullen. But Joseph, no, it didn't matter where he went or what he did. He was faithful. And he trusted in the favor of God that he, God had shown him and that he was going to steward that gift well. And he was going to maximize it. And he was going to use it no matter where he was, no matter where he went, no matter what he did. And because of that, God just said, okay, I've trusted you with this and you proved yourself faithful, so I'm going to give you more. And, I've, and you proved yourself faithful with that, and so I'm going to give you more. And God just keeps outpouring favor and favor and favor in Joseph's life. Favor has compounding interest. 
It's a free gift and it's a good gift. But the more we steward it and the better we are with it, the more God gives us. He said, I can trust you with little, I can trust you with a lot, and just keeps pouring out more and more in Joseph's life. And for us, we get ourselves messed up sometimes with the, the, the decision to, to compromise on things. And we know that, man, this is what God has called us to. And so we're in a situation like, like Joseph, and maybe we've got a temptation in front of us, whatever that is. It's different for so many of us. But oftentimes temptation offers us a, a temporary solution to a permanent problem. So we think, yeah, I know this isn't the best idea, but if I do this right now, it's just gonna, it's gonna feel good or it's gonna help me or it's gonna give me some, some relief. And so we make those choices to compromise and it sort of just chips away at our character a little bit every time and jeopardizes our level of favor a little bit, I think, every time in our life. Listen, the enemy, Satan, has an agenda in your life as well. If God's agenda for your life is favor, the enemy's agenda is destruction. He hates you. He wants you dead. He doesn't want the favor of God on display in your life. He doesn't want God to do good things in your life. He doesn't want God to use you to do good things. And so he's going to do everything he can to mess you up and to trip you up and to throw things into your path, just like he did for Joseph. All right? Just like he threw things in Joseph's path and Joseph's life all the time. But Joseph said, no, no, I'm, I know what God has called me to. I know what God has placed in front of me. I know that the good things in my life are coming straight from God. Think, think about it this way. right? When we, when we think about favor, I had this blackboard here. I know you guys are just absolutely chomping at the bit to see what I'm going to do with it. So I'm going to try, I'm going to attempt to draw two circles freehand in front of you. This is nerve-wracking, all right? Don't make fun of me if they look like eggs, all right? One, all right, that's not too bad, not too bad. There we go. All right, two circles. That one's a little wobbly, but you guys, you can see it, right? Two circles, and we're going to call this one the divine. This is God over here, and this one is the human. So that's us. So this sort of, this sort of represents kind of how uh, uh, we're going to call it a favor graph, all right? So this is, this is God in all of his goodness, all of his amazingness, all of his divine sovereignty, all of his, all of his grace, all of his omnipotence, like just, it's, it's God in all of his majesty and glory on display. And then there's us, the, the, the humans, you know, and we've, we're less than perfect. We know that, right? If you think you're perfect, then you're in the wrong church because we're all jacked up. Everybody in the Bible is jacked up. That's just the way it works. We've got a little something called sinful nature, okay, that just pulls us to be anything less than what God's best is. And, and Satan is going to capitalize on that sinful nature, and he's going to just constantly tell us that we don't have what it takes, and we're not good enough, and we don't deserve the favor of God. We don't deserve the grace of God. And God says, no, 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 no. The gift of grace is free for everyone. And God has done all the work for us. He's come as close to us as he possibly can. Like the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, my friends, like the, the, the deed is done. That any, anything that we feel like is holding us back from God, anything we feel like is disqualifying us from the grace and the favor of God in our life has already been taken care of. You can see there's an overlap there, that God has come as close to us as he possibly can. But then there's a level of human responsibility and obedience because I think that God is a gentleman and God doesn't force himself on us. He says, you know, I've come as close to you as I can and now I'm gonna let you make the decision on how you wanna live your life and how you wanna conduct yourself. And that's what separated Joseph from his brothers because Joseph's brothers were willing to say, you know, we're gonna try and we're gonna do our own thing. We're gonna go a different way. We're gonna, we're gonna give in to temptation. We'll compromise our character a little bit because in this moment it seems right and it's gonna feel good. And Joseph said, no, I'll be, I'll be found faithful to God. I'm going I'm to be faithful to my calling. And so as we choose to move in our humanity toward the divine, toward the gift of grace, there's like this little overlap zone. And I'm going to call that the favor zone, all right? You're going to have to read sideways if that's cool because this board isn't big enough. That's the favor zone. And this is where we make decisions to say, no, God, I want to work. I want to live my life in tandem with you. So I want my words and my actions and my thoughts to reflect your heart. Like I want the Holy Spirit that lives in me to be what drives me and what fuels me and what gives me strength in everything that I do. And God, I want to be found faithful regardless of my circumstance. And so in those moments when we're tempted to be anything less, it's a conscious decision to say, no, 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 God, I want to move towards you and not away from you. I'm not going to be tempted by anything that's, that's less than the best that you have for me. And when I think we live our lives and we conduct our lives that way, that's what Joseph did. He just constantly said, God, no, I'm, fa I'm faithful to you no matter what. You go back and you read chapter 38 of Genesis. It actually tells a story of one of Joseph's brothers, Judah. And it's almost as if, it's definitely as if the author of Genesis is comparing and contrasting Joseph 
and Judah. And he's saying, look how jacked up and messed up Judah is. Like, you want to you wanna jeopardize the favor of God in your life? Then do what Judah did, all right? Because he's, he's, he's messed up. He gave in to everything that was in his humanity and his sinful nature and just did some horrible, crazy things. But then he tells a story, the author tells a story of Joseph and says, you, know, you want the favor of God on display in your life? You want, you want to live in this zone right here, like working with God? God and not fighting against the person that he created you to be and fighting against the plan that he put into place for your life long before you were even formed in your mother's womb. Like if you want that on display in your life, then you live like Joseph and be found faithful like Joseph. And that favor zone right there, that's where, that's where everything good in our life is unlocked right there. Everything that's, that's, that's perfect and that's awesome like is unlocked right here in that favor zone. Think of it, think of it this way, all right? If that's not doing it for you, think of it this way like a, like a band. If I brought two of our musicians up here today or a bunch of them and I brought them up on stage and I said, okay, guys, play us a song. What's going to happen? They're going to have to get on the same page if this is going to be a good experience for us, right? We've got some amazing musicians, but if they don't have time to communicate and to work together and to get on the same page and play the same notes and play the same chords and Lord hopes they're playing the same song, you know, like if they work together, they can make sweet music. If they don't, it's going to be a total gong show, right? And this is kind of like that relationship where God says, he wants to be in relationship with us. He wants us to work in tandem together. He wants our words and our thoughts and our actions and our character to be a reflection of the image of God that he has placed inside of every single one of us. You've got the image of God in your life, even if you don't know it and you don't recognize it yet, you do. I believe that because the Bible says it. And God wants us to live our lives in response to that image of God that he's already stamped on us. He wants us to to live and to strive for this this favor zone right here. And there is a level of God's done all the work, but he, he gives us a level of responsibility and obedience to respond to it and to just reach out and accept it and acknowledge that it's his plan for our life. And, and what I love about the story and the, the life of times of Joseph, if we read through his entire story here in the book of Genesis, is that there's another really important truth about favor that we've got to talk about. And is that, that favor is definitely found by the faithful, yes, but favor does not necessarily equate fun, all right? Favor does not necessarily equate frivolity. And this is where we get favor sometimes mixed up a little bit in the church because you've heard of the prosperity gospel, you know, and people tend to frown on that a little bit, health, wealth, and prosperity. And you've got to understand that in the, in the favor zone, like you may experience health, wealth, and prosperity, and I hope you do. I hope I do. That'd be great, wouldn't it? And Joseph certainly had seasons of that in his life. But guess what? Being thrown into a pit and sold into slavery by your brothers is not fun. But he was still in the favor zone. Being exploited sexually by your master's wife is not fun, but he was still in the favor zone. Being wrongfully imprisoned is not fun, but he's still in the favor zone, right? And so it's like this, this realization that for us, like oftentimes if we think, okay, I need the favor of God in my life because I need more and I want more and I want my life to be better and I want to be wealthier and I want to be healthier, whatever it is, if that's what we're looking for and we're trying to access the favor of God, then we've already lost it because that's not how, that's not how it works. But if we're willing to move past the scarcity mindset that says I need more and realize we already have everything in Jesus. His grace and his favor has already been given to us freely. There's nothing more that you need. And when we approach favor that way and God's favor and God's blessing in our life that way and say, God, man, I want to see your spirit at work in my life. I want to see your favor in my life so that your kingdom will be further, so that your kingdom work will be done, so that your heaven will come to earth. You're right here in my life and that will be on display. Like if you look at Joseph's life, people recognized God in him. Potiphar, who was a pagan Egyptian soldier, an officer, recognized God's blessing and God's favor in Joseph's life. And I think the reason that God pours out favor to us is because he loves us and because he cares for us. But at the end of the day, it's because we want people to see God in us. And we want people to see God at work in our life. Put it this way. Being faithful in the mess makes room for God to bless. All right, I don't think there's any simpler way that we can put that. Being faithful in the mess leaves room for God to bless. And that's exactly what Joseph did. Every moment of his life, every day, didn't matter what his circumstance was, it didn't matter where he found himself, he lived 
understanding and believing that he was in the favor zone. Didn't matter if life was good. Didn't matter if life was difficult. Didn't matter if he was in a pit. Didn't matter if he was in jail. Didn't matter if he was sitting on Pharaoh's throne. Eventually, he would just keep on becoming the favorite of everybody in Egypt and became Pharaoh's favorite. He was the number two in the entire country of Egypt before his life was over because he lived in the favor zone. Didn't mean life was always easy, but he recognized and he understood that the hand of God was in his life and that he had a plan. Here's the thing, my friends, that it doesn't really make sense if you think about it. It doesn't really make sense for God to trust you with the big things that you've been asking for and that you've been waiting for until you're faithful with what he's already given you. You know, that's just good, that's just good parenting. You know, if you've got kids, like we're, you're trying to teach them and nurture them and help them to understand, like you're gonna, you're gonna give them something small to start with, some small levels of responsibility to start with. And as, as they prove themselves faithful, like you give them more and more and more. Like that's, that's just how we learn, right? And God has given every single one of us a measure of favor. It looks different in every one of our lives. Certainly our circumstances and our backgrounds are different. But God has spoken a promise of favor over you. If you've accepted God's gift of salvation, salvation just literally means to turn from your sinful nature and to start walking towards God and on a new path. Like if you've accepted that in your life, then you've been given grace and you've been given a measure of favor in your life. But it's your decision how you steward that. It's your decision how you access that. Here's what's crazy is that you, again, reading through Genesis and the guys that God showed up and he worked through like Abraham and Abraham's son Isaac and his son Jacob and then all of Joseph's 10 older brothers, like those guys were messed up. Burning piles of trash come to mind when I think about the things those guys did and the way they lived their lives and they conducted themselves. But God said, no, you're my, you're my chosen people. I've already overcome all of that. I've already overcome all the brokenness. I've already overcome all the shortcomings. I've overcome, I've overcome all the sin. It's nothing that you can do, but it's what I want to do. It's what I want to do in you. And God's looking for us to make the decision to recognize and to say, no, God, I know that you've given me favor. And regardless of my circumstance, regardless of what's going on in my life right now, I want to be found faithful. Somebody in church needs to hear this today before we leave, okay? That the... The promises that God has spoken over you and the favor that he's spoken over your life. Hear this, church, if you don't hear anything else today. It's never been more true. His promises have never been more true in your life than they are right now in this exact second. You're watching online and you're listening to this. Like God's favor and his promise of favor in your life has never been more true than it is right now in the second. I don't care what's going on at home. I don't care what sort of baggage you came in here with. I don't care what sort of weight you feel like you're under and that's got you broken and has got you beaten down. His promises of favor have never been more true in your life than they are right now. Because God's promises are constant. It's only up to us to become aware of that fact. Joseph and his brothers had equal access to God. Joseph was the one who capitalized on it. Joseph was the one who said, God, I'll be found faithful. Favor is found by the faithful church. And for us, what it really comes down to is a hunger and a thirst for more. To say, God, I want to see more of you on display in my life. I want to see more of your favor poured out in my life, not for my sake, but for the people that I love, for my family and for my work, for my community, for my city. Like if, if our church said, God, I want more of your favor in my life and I'll, be, I'll do the work. God, I'll do the work to be found faithful. I'll do the work to be obedient. I'll accept my responsibility in this. Man, can you imagine what God could do in our region? God's, God's we're, we're here. Listen, we're in the favor zone. God's doing some amazing things, but there's always more that he's calling us to. It's a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. So the only question for us, church, is how thirsty are you? How thirsty are you? Let's pray. Father, we love you, God. God, and we are so thankful and just, just overwhelmed and joyful. God, there's so much hope. God, I, God, would no one leave this place today with anything but joy and hope in their hearts of the favor that you've spoken over their life, God. 
But there's no one here today, Father, that you don't want to pour your favor out onto, God. There's no one here who's beyond the reach of your grace, God, and your love. So, God, today we just speak that over, over our church and over our people. And, God, today would you move in hearts and lives. And, God, would you bless those who are found faithful. God, would the faithful receive your favor, Jesus. And God, would you give us the, the strength and the courage and the resilience of Joseph, Father, that no matter what we're facing, no matter what we go through, today could be great, tomorrow could be horrible, but regardless, we will be found faithful to you, Father. And would your favor be poured out in this place, God? Would your favor be poured out in these individual lives? God, would your favor be poured out in our families? God, would your favor be poured out in our church? And because of that, Jesus, not for our own sakes, Father, but will we see more of you on display, God? Will we see more of your grace, more of your forgiveness, God, more of your kindness just wash over St. John, just wash over New Brunswick and wash over Canada, Father. When we recognize this and we walk in this, God, will we find ourselves in the favor zone? God, and we thank you for that gift. God, we recognize that gift. God, we're so grateful for it. God, will we be good stewards of what you've given us? God, give us a hunger and a thirst for more of you, Jesus, more of you. That's our prayer, God. We love you and we ask in your name.